Theda Bara, the Hollywood Vampire. One spring morning in 1920, a handsome, full-figured, heavily made-up young woman walked along a Hollywood suburban street. She noticed a little girl sitting on a fence. Tears were rolling down her cheeks from coming off second best in a childish squabble. The woman went up to her and put an arm consolingly around her shoulder. She had been shopping and from a bag produced a fine red apple. It was pushed into the child's hand and the sob seized. The child looked round at the woman and stared at her for a second. Recognition dawn. The vampire, she screamed in terror, jumped down and ran wildly towards her home. The woman shrugged, smiled a little sadly and continued on her way. She was used to such receptions. Her name was Theda Barra, one of the queens of the silent screen. She was the greatest vamp of her day. Known as the vampire from one of her most successful films, she was dubbed the wickedest woman in the world. Theda Barra was born Theodosia Goodman in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1890, a dark, plump beauty with jet black hair falling below her shoulders. She was working in small bit parts in silent films in her teens. She worked for the Parthe Company in New York under the name of Theda Barra. Publicity releases claimed she was the daughter of Theda de Coppet, a French woman, and Giuseppe Barra, an Italian painter. Actually, she chose her film name herself. Theda was a childhood adaption from Theodosia. Barra came from her mother's maiden name, Baranga. In 1915, producer William Fox was just starting to build his later colossal film empire. He planned a film called A Fool There Was. The title was a reference to Kipling's poem, The Vampire, which ran, A fool there was, and he made his prayer, even as you and I, to a rag, a bone, and a hank of hair. But the fool, he called it his lady fair. Principal role in the film was a siren. Mary Pickford turned it down as unsuitable for America's sweetheart. Fox's director, Frank Powell, then suggested Theda Barra. He liked her in her previous picture, The Two Little Orphans. The film was a hit. Siren Theda Barra was rushed into the second of the 40 pictures she was to make before her retirement in 1921. To cash in on the success, the second was called Vampire. Following quickly came money makers such as Destruction, Forbidden Path, The Serpent, Gold and the Woman, She Devil, Salome, and Eternal Sappho. Theda Barra Prophet set Fox on the path to later millions. Realising he had found a gold mine, he hired a team of press agents to cement her reputation as that vampire woman. She was given completely new parentage as the illegitimate child of a French painter and an Arab princess. Born in the shadow of the Sphinx, her surname was supposedly Arab spelled backwards. Theda was a rearrangement by her unhappy mother of the letters in the word death. Almost overnight, Theda Barra shot to international fame. Almost overnight, Theda Barra shot to international fame. She was the epitome of all vamps with mascara ringed eyes, moist lips, flowing tresses, and a constant aura of smouldering sex. Audiences gasped as, in The Vampire, she was pictured reclining languidly on a leopard-skin couch. A turbaned lover burst into the tent. His nostrils quavered like the gills of a fish. Theda Barra eyed him up and down provocatively. Pulses leapt in the stalls as there flashed on the silent screen her testy command, "'Kiss me, fool!' The expression was taken up by comedians. It became the famous trademark of the worst of the vamps. It lived on as the punchline in a hundred saucy vaudeville sketches. Theda Barra portraits were sent free by the thousands to her fans. They generally depicted her dressed in nothing but a handful of beads and surrounded by exotic paraphernalia of the occult, skeletons, crystal balls, pet snakes. Sent off to Hollywood, she stopped en route in Chicago. Her press agents failed to engineer a scandal-provoking visit to her hotel room by the mayor. Instead, they arranged a conference with local newspaper reporters. She greeted them as she reclined languorously on a couch in a filmy red robe. She answered questions in a slow, hushed voice. The atmosphere was heavy with incense. All the while, Theda's fingers caressed a human skull. Round her neck, the reporters discerned a necklace of bones. Thus, the never-slackening camp campaign went on to blacken Theda Barra as the vampiest vamp of the screen. It paid off. Millions more queued to see her in Double Life, Ivory Angel, Madame de Barry, Purgatory, Rose of Blood, Cleopatra. 
Fox tried to preserve the personality he had created with a cast-iron contract, which bristled with clauses aimed to build up her reputation for mystery and seductiveness. She was forbidden to appear in public without a heavy veil, ride in a public conveyance, marry, go to a Turkish bath. More and more publicity was ground up. Theda Bara was labelled the beautiful and the damned. Fans crowded in millions to her murky melodramas, lured by such titles as Soulmate of the Devil. She was called living evidence of man's corruptible nature. In an interview, she boldly claimed that she was the first woman, frankly, to admit her desire for love. Her chief press agents, John Goldrap and Al Seelis, vied with each other in devising ever more luring blurbs of the exotic sin she was supposed to typify. Others may have lured men to tragedy, it was claimed, but only Theda Bara could laugh and laugh at their despair. Her income rocketed to $25,000 a week by 1920. The Theda Bara legend was helped along by vehement critics. Across America, outraged public opinion denounced her and her films as a menace to moral society. Theda Bara herself helped to swell the storm. In interviews, she ridiculed American women and dismissed them as fluffy little prudes. Clergymen attacked her from their pulpits. Fans still flocked to Theda Bara films. Increasingly, numbers of women believed the legend, joined in an almost hysterical campaign against the arch-villainous. Stern-faced wives gathered outside cinemas when her film showed and kicked down stands showing her photograph. On a New York visit in 1919, an angry woman rushed up to a policeman for protection. Theda Bara, who loved all children, had merely bent to speak to the woman's little son in the street. An article was published in a magazine seriously claiming that Theda Bara had ruined 50 men with her wiles, made 100 families suffer, caused 50 children and 150 wives to beg her to give them back their daddies and husbands. A critic in a New York paper suggested that something should be done about censoring Theda Bara films. Repeatedly we have watched her drag respected citizens from their wives and families, he complained. Finally, they are left destitute, exhausted and generally suffering from delirium tremens, clawing the air in some melodramatic finale. Film executives exulted in the attacks as good publicity. The star's own family was quite unaffected. They welcomed the furor and changed their names by deed poll from Goodman to Barra. Theda Barra herself was the only one who took the criticism to heart. When the Hollywood child ran away screaming from her as the vampire woman in 1920, she went home and sobbed for hours. The following year, with a comfortable fortune salted away, she took it on herself to smash the carefully contrived Theda Barra legend. Without consulting her film employers, she called a press conference and asked that a statement she had prepared be published. I am not a vamp and I don't want to be one, it read. I am not the soulmate of the devil, and I wasn't born in the shadow of the Sphinx. Theda Bara knew she was throwing away her career, but she didn't care. Remorselessly, she bared all. I was born in Cincinnati, she revealed. I had a perfectly good Jewish father, and my name was Theodosia Goodman. I'm really a nice Jewish girl, and that's all. Furious film executives declared that Theda Bara had broken her contract and washed their hands of her. She didn't care. She had a million dollars in the bank, a few months later, she announced her complete retirement to marry director Charles Brabham. For other companies, she made a few films intermittently over the next five years. The last, in 1926, was The Unchastened Woman. With the myth of her past and her smouldering passions exploded, she had little box office appeal. None of these later films made money. Theda Barra was a product of early Hollywood when Ballyhoo was taken far more seriously. The gigantic hoax that was perpetrated with her could not be repeated today. To understand those days, Theda Barra herself said years later, you have to remember that people believed what they saw on the screen. No one had destroyed the grand illusion. They thought stars were as they appeared in films. Now everyone knows it is just make-believe. Theda Barra lived in Hollywood with her husband in comparative Hollywood seclusion. They were reported as remaining hand-holding sweethearts till her death in 1955. Her epitaph might be that she was the first of the great Hollywood sex stars. She began the long line that includes Jean Harlow, Mae West and the current moneymaker Marilyn Monroe.